ahead and take a seat. You guys look good this morning. It is so good to see you. Hey, also want to say good morning to all of you who are joining us online, um, either watching it live right now or later. We love you. We're glad that you're here. And if you are a guest visiting us with us this morning, we all let you know a little bit about who we are. My name is Pastor Brandon Ziske, the lead pastor at Austin Oaks Church. Our heartbeat is to be simply about Jesus because he's the one that matters. And we that's why we at a church here, we at a church, we here at Austin Oaks Church, we want to help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. That's a little bit about our heartbeat here. Um, also, hey, good morning to all of you out there in the fellowship area. Love you too. Um, it's a good morning to be together. It is a good morning to celebrate Jesus. And uh, this series that we're in is a very important series. And, and there's a reason why we are going in this direction. For the last five weeks, we've been talking about that the kingdom is God's, right? We've been looking at Daniel and going, how did he survive? How did he stand strong and love well in Babylon, the personification of evil for 70 years? And we are looking at a time in our modern day, how does the church show the love of Christ? Church, we've been saying this from day one when we get into this series. We've just been saying like over and over, this is our time as the church to shine brightly. We alone have a message of hope. And so when we're in this series talking about how the future is bright, I want you to hold two, two things here. One, it's bright for you. But don't just stop there. Because the gospel isn't just for you. Church isn't just for you. It's for the world. And so we have to ask ourselves the question about those around us, our communities around us, the city that we live in, is the future bright for them? And we want to come back and celebrate Jesus and focus on Jesus, and that's why we are in this series, because we need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the future is bright. And BJ did a phenomenal job last week. Like, church, come on. He did a great job. Okay, who thinks he should preach again? Yeah, he's mad at me right now. Because I immediately said, dude, I was like, listen, when you, when you fill in and you preach and you get to share your heart and you do a good job, that just means your job description changes. And he was just like, no, that's not what you hired me for. It doesn't matter, I'm his boss, right? Like, you can, he has to do whatever I say. But nonetheless, he did a great job by just unpacking Jeremiah 29. And just looking at Daniel and asking that question, what was the hope? What was the anchor that allowed him to stand strong and love well in Babylon? In a hostile culture, when you were taken captive, enslaved, taken away from your family, from the city of God, you're the people of God, and taken into a nation that hates all things related to God. And he, he looked at Jeremiah 29 and said, this has to be true. Daniel had to have known this prophecy because Jeremiah 29 was given before the exile. And God said, right, he promised his people that even in the midst of all of the pain and all of the confusion and all of the frustration, that he still knows the plans. He still has good plans for their welfare, to prosper them. He's got plans for them so that they would have a future and a hope. Did Daniel know what those plans were? Did he have any idea what those plans were? No, not at all. But he knew who God was, and he knew that God was good. He knew that God was faithful. So he grabbed hold of that and just took that and said, God is good, so therefore what God says is good. And if he promised that he has a plan in the future for us, I'm going to hang on to that. And he took those words, and it was those very words that allowed him to stand strong and love well and balance. It was those words that gave him the hope that allowed him to have a bright present because he knew the future was bright. He didn't know what the plan was. All he needed was God's word, and he needed to know God's faithfulness, knowing that whatever God said, God would do. He needed those words and the ability to place his trust in the very one who would follow through on those words. This morning, I want to encourage you, and even if it's not your normal practice, I want you to grab a Bible. Okay, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. For those of you at home, this is a great time to grab it. If you get, get a phone, you know, pull at your phone. Just promise me you're not going to check your fantasy football. 
You know, you're not going to check to see who's playing, who's not playing, all that kind of good stuff. So I want you to pay attention. I really want you to get into God's Word this morning because the passage that we're going to look at is so amazing. It's breathtaking how descriptive this is and how it points to the plan that God gave Israel and the plan for all of humanity. I'm going to pray because I need the Spirit to communicate His heart and His Word to us this morning. So Father, we pray, just like we sang earlier, that one, you would open up the heavens, that we would see your Son, Jesus. I think about when He was baptized and a voice came from heaven, your voice came and you said that this is my beloved Son, whom I love, and with Him I have well pleased. Listen to Him. So Lord, we ask for your spirit to speak. We pray that it's your voice that is the loudest in this room. It's your voice that is the loudest out there in our homes, in our cars, in our days, in our busyness. So Lord, would you give us the power to receive what it is that you have for us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. I had a teacher in sixth grade that I had a love-hate relationship with. I mean, I believed, completely believed that she had it out for me. And, and I have the proof to prove that she did. It was like no matter what I did, no matter what I said, no matter what actions I took, I always felt like she had this eye, this critical eye to grab hold of every little thing, every little word I said and just critique it. She gave me so many hours of detention. It was gross. I legitimately thought she hated me, but the reality is I was 12 years old at that time and she had every reason to be hard on me because I was a troubled kid. I was a bit of a stray cat at that age. And, I was, and I'm not like being facetious or over-exaggerating, but it was true. I was heading down a path at that age, at 12 years old, that I know wasn't going to lead to good things. And it's, it's mind-boggling to me that I am where I am today. When I look at like my daughter, she's 12, and I just started to think about the things that I was doing when I was 12. And I was like, oh Lord Jesus, please, you raise our kids, you keep them safe, and it's only by God's grace I am where I am. I was troubled, and I knew that. I remembered even believing at that point in my life that I wasn't a good kid. And I wasn't just saying it just like for pity, like I legitimately believed I was a bad kid that there was no hope for me, that there was nothing good for me because all of the fruit of my life was proving otherwise. I didn't have a lot of hope. There was not a lot of joy. But Mrs. Trzeski, my sixth grade teacher, that's a good Wisconsin last name right there, she spoke truth to me over and over and over. She would constantly inform me that she was hard on me because she saw something in me, to which I was like, you see nothing. You just like to torture me, right? Like, that was always how I felt. But she kept saying, she's like, I just see something in you. I see a bright future for you. But I, I couldn't believe it. Like, I didn't see it. And, and like, I had a hard time grabbing hold of what she was saying because I kept thinking to myself, like, who is she? She's not a fortune teller. How does she know what my future holds? She's just saying that to be nice. In fact, it's just her excuse to be mean to me. But those words somehow got into my heart and just stirred things up inside of me. And it produced something that I began to understand later in life as hope. And I look back at those words she would say constantly over me like, there's a bright future for you. There's things for you. And I looked at her actions and I started to believe them because her words and her actions began to match up. But today, more than ever, we live in a society where we don't even know who to believe. Which facts are true? Which news station's true? What do we believe? Do we create our own truth? Everything feels all relative and all squishy. So how do we know? Where do we find hope? What words do we look to? We are so disillusioned, in a lot of ways, disillusioned in our political system because a lot of people just give a lot of empty promises and you just don't know if you want to even put your trust in them. Folks, this is why I say we as the church, this is our time to rise up and to shine brightly for Jesus because it's through the church that the world has any hope because of Jesus. We look at Jesus, we need to declare to the world that there is one who can speak words that are concrete, that are trustworthy, and he will follow through on every single word he says. As good as it is, and we need people to speak truth into our life, we need people to give us hope in our life, but what we need 
are words that come from Almighty God that give us a picture of the reality but also make it very clear that there's a bright future that awaits us if we are willing to receive the good news that he has for us through Jesus. You see, Israel, when they heard God's words of promise, they didn't know what to do with it. Before the exile came, before Daniel and Jerusalem was taken captive over to Babylon, they were, the prophets were speaking like, okay, listen, you're going to be punished. You're going to be chastised for your sin. You will reap what you sow. But listen, God loves you. He's not going to leave you. There's going to be a hope for you. There's going to be a future for you, okay? He's declaring hope to them, but they didn't know what to do with it. In fact, a lot of Israelites at the time discredited those prophets. They didn't want to believe in those prophets, but there were some who did. They didn't know how to handle God's words of hope. Many of them just flat out rejected it. Multiple prophets speaking hope. You got Isaiah, you got Jeremiah, speaking these beautiful words, Habakkuk, speaking these beautiful words of hope. But God is so good. That even when we decide to to cast off his words, he's relentless. He will continue to be a light in the darkness. He will continue to provide words of hope if we would only receive them. And here's what I know to be true. When things look bleak in our lives, when things look dark in our lives, it is very hard to find hope within. In and of ourselves, it's hard to find hope. It's also very hard to find hope within our immediate circumstances. And that's why we need to have hope from God. He alone can give the words that can paint a bright future. In Isaiah 52, verse 7, we see this beautiful picture of how God always comes, how God always brings a message of hope from what feels like from the hills. Look at verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Isaiah wrote this either before the captivity to Babylon or in the midst of captivity of Babylon. We don't fully know, but it was right in that time frame. And he's speaking to them, basically saying, it's like, listen, you're going to a dark and dismal scenario. Your context and circumstances are going to be bleak. But listen, there's going to be one that's going to come from the hills, and he's going to bring a message of good news. And when you hear, you're going to go, man, his feet are beautiful because his message is God reigns. This message came 700 years before Jesus. This is one of the first times it's crystal clear that God is bringing a gospel, a message of good news. Don't give up. Don't surrender. He's coming. He's going to be victorious. In 52 verse 8, it continues, The voice of your watchmen, the people, the soldiers on guard to watch to see what's happening. They see this messenger in the distance. They lift up their voice and together they sing for joy for eye to eye. They see the return of the Lord to Zion. It's a symbolic picture. And when they see these messengers coming on the hills with this message, they know this is good news of victory. It's a beautiful image. Break forth together in singing, verse 9. You waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. When all looks lost, when all looks bleak, when all looks completely dismal, he has come. He has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm. I want you to take note of that because that's going to be the whole point of the message here. Before all the eyes of the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. God has bared his holy arm. This is God's key strategic play, his key maneuver to defeat the enemy, to redeem his people. It's his secret weapon. And at this time, nothing remains except for the people to receive this message. The context matters. Israel at this moment when they're hearing this is in a hopeless situation. Either knowing 
that they're going to be taken captive or they're in the midst of captivity. And God is saying, listen, I'm not leaving you. I'm letting you know that your future is bright because I'm going to win. I'm going to conquer. I will redeem you. I will comfort you. But what do you do in that moment when you hear those words and everything around you doesn't match up? What would you do? What is this key strategic play? This was 700 years. Some of you in this room have a hard time believing that the Bible is God's word. Listen, this is why I want you in God's word this morning, because I want you to see how awesome this is. This was written 700 years before Jesus. And what we're going to read now is going to beautifully describe in great detail the life of Jesus. And this was written 700 years prior but in that time, from 700 years to when Jesus came, there was this period of 400 years of complete silence. Complete silence. God wasn't speaking. No words from any prophets. No message of hope. They had this. It was more than enough if they would just simply receive it. But can you imagine the questions? It's those moments when you get that bad news and you're just hanging on for goodness sakes. Like, when's the good news going to come? Jesus, I thought you were good. I thought you answered prayer. I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying. Why aren't you intervening? Why aren't you working things out the way I think you should work things out? Why aren't you showing up the way I think you should show up? God, where are you? And it's those moments of conflict and tension where you are tempted to let go of the words of hope that are spoken. And you begin to wonder if God is able to fulfill the words he has said. How many of you have ever been there? You know God said he's good. You heard people say that God is good. You sing songs that God is good. But in those moments where you wonder if God is good, what do you do? Do you hang on to those words, believing that God will follow through? Or just because your present circumstance, your present moment isn't matching up with what you think, do you give up hope? Your future is bright. Because God always gives a message of hope. What will you do with it? 700 years later, 700 years later, comes one running over the hills. There's one that comes 700 years later proclaiming that your God reigns. His kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe. Don't surrender. Don't give up. Your present future is bright. It was from a person who was prophesied about 700 years ago. In Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. Again, a message that was written before the exile. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway of our God. 700 years. God said one will come in 700 years and he will prepare the way of the Lord. He will bring the message of good news and his feet will be beautiful. This is a message of hope for a lost and dying world. And we see it fulfilled in Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist He's the one who Isaiah talked about 700 years previous. You see, whatever God says, he will do. Whatever God says, he will do. Time is not a thing to God. This messenger's name was John the Baptist, and his message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's going down in our time. He's going to come out after me. It's going to happen in our moment. Repent. Prepare your hearts. It's coming. Can you imagine the anticipation happening in Israel in that moment? They were longing for this king. They were longing for God to make things right. They knew the Old Testament prophecies that God would establish a kingdom where his reign would rule supreme and everybody would know beyond a shadow of doubt that God is king. He wouldn't hide his glory no more. He wouldn't reveal, he wouldn't like conceal himself. He would be on display for all nations, for all time. So of course they were excited. John's like, listen, I'm bringing this message of hope. It is time. And then, 
And then something unheard of happens. Then one comes. One who no one anticipated. He showed up on the scene in a way that nobody foresaw coming. He came as a king unlike any other king. He doesn't embody any stereotype of any kind of hero, savior of humanity. He surely didn't meet people's expectations, but he came nonetheless. Remember Isaiah 59, 10, 700 years prior, the Lord has bared his holy arm. He's going to reveal his secret weapon, his strategic move that no one saw coming. John's message is that God is bearing his holy arm before the nations, that the king is coming to save, and God's arm is none other than Jesus. And when Jesus came on the scene, he made it crystal clear what his purpose was. In fact, it is the only person that can give real and actionable hope to this world. It is the only words, his words are the only words that can actually secure for us and for the world a bright future. Mark 1, verses 14 through 15, he goes on, right, and he says to people, proclaiming the gospel, the kingdom of God is at hand. The time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. Now, I'm here. Now, all things change. He came. He said it 700 years ago, but God always acts on what he says. The time is fulfilled. Jesus taught this. He proclaimed this. He lived this. He even died for this. In Matthew 4, 23, he goes all through old Galilee. He's teaching in synagogue after synagogue after synagogue, and he's proclaiming the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease, every affliction among the people. In fact, he grabs in Luke 4 in his hometown in Nazareth, he grabs the scroll of Isaiah, if you haven't caught on, which was written how many years ago? 700 years ago, he grabs the scroll of a message of hope given to people in a dark and bleak circumstances 700 years ago that was to mention who he is. He grabs that scroll, strategically rolls out to Isaiah 61, and he reads this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And you can hear a pin drop in the room. And he rolls up the scroll, and he gives it back to the attendant, and he sits down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him like, we know what this means. We know what this is talking about. And then Jesus says something that completely shocks them. Today, this scripture that was written 700 years ago is fulfilled in your hearing. Game on. It's a direct quote. This is the good news of the kingdom. This alone is the hope that comes from the hills. It's the only hope that makes all things bright in our present and it secures our future. I love the way Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, so many of us, we lose hope with God because we grow impatient with time. But when the fullness of time has come, he bared his holy arm. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under a law, so that we might receive the adoption of sons and daughters. Here's the question. Why wasn't this received as good news? Why didn't they receive it as good news back in Isaiah's time when Jesus came? Why don't people receive it as good news today? Why do people reject him? Why did they reject him back then? Why did people mock him back then? Why do people mock Jesus today? Why did they deny Jesus back then? Why do they deny him today? Why doesn't this message of hope seem to make sense to people back then? Why doesn't it seem to create any traction today? It's just that Jesus doesn't seem to fit the mold that people want him to fit. 
People have forgotten that we're under law, that we're sinful. We would rather live for ourselves and choose other idols than besides God. We would rather secure our own future. We don't trust always what he says. How can we trust him? His way of life and what he calls us to live and how to live? No, I don't like it. It doesn't fit with the way I want it to be. Jesus doesn't really conquer our real problems. He doesn't really change our real circumstances. He doesn't really comfort us. He doesn't really save us. I mean, I hear these things all the time. Do we know what he even saved us from? Like, really know? Besides just a textbook answer, do we really know? Do we really know at what lengths he went to redeem and comfort the world? Jesus paid a high, high cost. And just like Israel back then and still today, many fail to understand the reality, who our real enemies are, what our real oppression is, what our real um, obstacles are. We are under the law. We are cursed. We are enslaved to sin. Our evil, evil resides in our hearts. We are forever separated from God. He had to come and conquer that. There is no freedom in this world until that freedom is to be had. There is no joy in this world until that joy is to be had. God sent his, his son when we have openly and actively rejected him and would rather worship slash live for ourselves. So here's the deal. Because of Jesus, the opportunity to have a bright future break into your present is available to you right now. It's available to the world. Because he said it and he acted upon it. The question is, is what will you do with Jesus? And I know this is going to sound probably a little bit stark, but there's really two options here. You will either see Jesus as repulsive or redemptive. In fact, Isaiah said this about Jesus 700 years ago. 52 Verse 13 of Isaiah. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. This word acting wisely meaning he will succeed. My servant will succeed. He will be victorious. He will achieve what I send him out for. His servant is none other than Jesus. 700 years ago, God made it clear what the plan was. But at present time, they didn't know what to look for. My servant will act wisely. He will conquer. And then you would expect what to follow here in Isaiah's prophecy to be of a conquering king, a hero unlike all heroes, the greatest avenger of all. Come on. Come on. I, I'm a nerd, okay? Like you would expect that. But it's not what we see. Verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. That's not because he was born differently. It's because he was beaten so cruelly by the Roman soldiers that when people looked at Jesus, they were astonished by the way he looked because of the beating he has taken. What king, what conquering king would allow that? And his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Like, he, he was so disfigured, so beaten. He was so beyond, re, people re, were repulsed when they looked at him. They couldn't even handle it. Like, they got so tired of Jesus and all the words that he was saying there, they finally got to the point where, like, let's just crucify him, let's get rid of him, let's kill him. His blood was poured out. It was sprinkled. Verse 15, so he sprinkled many nations with his blood. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. No one foresaw this coming. No king would have ever thought that this is the way that you would save or redeem or conquer, that you would allow yourself to be beaten, that you would allow your blood to be spilt, but this is how victory was won. This is how our God gives comfort. This is how our God gives hope. And this is absolutely repulsive to many. 
The Jews couldn't stomach this. The Romans couldn't stomach this. The Gentile world couldn't stomach it. And still people to this day can't stomach it. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. The prophet moves from astonishment to flat-out rejection. It moved from it being astonished that this servant king would suffer so much for other people to rejection because he's so ordinary. He's so unassuming. But this is the revealed arm of the Lord. He doesn't come into the scene like a conquering hero. He comes under the radar, just like he does in our hearts. On the surface of things, he's not impressive. He's not the most handsome of fellas. Our statues do a great disservice because we think Jesus looks like Fabio. <laughs> but there was nothing assuming about him. He was ordinary. He looked unpromising. He comes from an unpromising family. He's a son of a poor carpenter who lives in a failed nation. How can he be the king of a forever kingdom? I mean, his family didn't even believe in Jesus until after he conquered death by resurrecting. He didn't walk around with this holy glow around him that everybody knew that he was different. No. He was despised. He was looked down upon. He came to his own people. He was rejected. He loved his enemies. He turned the other cheek. He took on abuse, became a man of sorrows because so many people misunderstood him. He knew where he was going and he knew what he was doing, which made him completely familiar with grief. People couldn't tolerate him. People were often repelled because of him because of the abuse and the suffering and the ridicule he took on. We don't want anything to do with him. Surely, verse 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, as if he was cursed. But he was pierced, not because of who he is, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 700 years before Jesus came, Isaiah's writing as if they and us are at the cross, because we were. And as we look at this servant, this conquering king, it wasn't his guilt that put him there. No, it was our guilt. It was our sins, it was our rebellion, our transgressions, our falling short, our evil, our choices that required that Jesus would have to die. So Jesus substituted himself for us at the cross willingly. Jesus for me. Jesus died in my place. The sorrows that he carried were our sorrows. And God has shifted the blame of humanity to Jesus as he died for guilty people. What king would do that? He laid on him the iniquity of us all. Humanity's guilt has to be paid for. Otherwise, there's no freedom. There's no joy. There's no hope. There can be no bright future. And this guilt, it can't be swept under the rug and ignored as if it's not there. We can't try to placate God. We can't try to appease him with doing good things and trying to look good. No, it's impossible. We are lawbreakers. We are rebellious. It has to be paid for. It has to be made right. God can't turn a blind eye to our evil. This alone is the very definition of love. This alone is what makes our future bright. Jesus substituting himself, sacrificing himself, paid off our guilt and our shame with his blood so that we can become children of God. His punishment, his punishment brought us peace. He came for us. When we rejected him, 
That brought us peace. Oh, by the way, we're all sheep. We all have turned aside. What's wrong with the world? What's wrong with our nation? What's wrong with our government? What's wrong with people? What's wrong with people on Facebook and Instagram? What's wrong with them? Oh, I know. They're sheep. They're evil. Sinners. That's not fun language to talk about. Go ahead, post that. You'll get a lot of comments. We're not going to call people evil. We know the heart is evil apart from Jesus. That's why there's no remedy out there. Friends, how amazing that this was talked about 700 years before Jesus even came. This is why this is true. We have all turned our own way. Verse 7 through 9. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. You want to talk about injustice? This is the greatest act of injustice that humanity has ever seen. An innocent man, a perfect man who said no wrong, who did no wrong, was crucified as a guilty sinner, a criminal, for us. Who, if we were there at that time, would have looked at Jesus and probably mocked him as well. He came for us, died for us. This is the message of Christmas. We have a forever king who's establishing a forever kingdom that was foretold 700 years ago to a people in a hopeless circumstance to hang on to these words of hope because these words of hope guarantee that your future is bright. In fact, it is so bright that it penetrates your darkness right now. That is how Daniel was able to stand in the darkness. We now know what that plan is, is Jesus So I want to ask two questions. One, is your future bright? Do you know why you're saved? Do you know why he came? Is your future bright? There's only one that can guarantee that future. There's only one that can offer that hope. It's Jesus. He was the one who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, buried, who rose again from the dead, and is now seated at the hand of God the Father Almighty. He dealt with the guilt and shame of the human race that is forever darkened and blacked out hope. Jesus suffered once. He no longer is suffering. He reigns. He will never lose. He's forever conquered. He's forever victorious. So in order for your future to be bright, listen, my friends, you've got to let go of the past. You've got to turn from the old, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's for you right now. And he extends this as a gift of grace to you for you to receive by faith. Maybe this is the morning for you to receive that gift of life. I don't encourage you. If you have questions, come talk to me, BJ, Chad, Nima, anybody. Grab a stranger. Hey, I want to talk to you about Jesus. If you're online, comment, message, let us know. You can have a bright future. But I know some of you in this room right now have been thinking, yeah, my future's bright, I'm good. I want to ask a question. Is their future bright? Yeah, yours is good. But is their future bright? Your family, your kids, your neighbors, your co-workers. Is their future bright? Did you know that we have a beautiful obligation to be a messenger of hope? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is a season 
unlike any other, where people are really looking for answers. They're looking for something else. They're looking for alternative. They're looking for hope. And we alone in the church, because of Jesus, have that. Will you be that messenger of hope for another person? You see, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Church, let's take on the role of being a messenger of hope. He came, the Lord revealed his arm in a way that nobody foresaw. And it's forever changed life. Jesus, we thank you for your word. And I ask that now, Lord, that you would take my words and, and you would symbolically or even literally take them and turn them from water to wine. Lord, that you would do what you need to do in the hearts of your children. Lord, I want to pray for my friends out there who are feeling hopeless right now, who feel like there is no bright future for them. Lord, I pray that your gospel and your grace would penetrate their hearts, their minds, and Lord, in that through you, through not just your words, but the fact that you acted on them, you acted on them in a way that nobody could have foresaw. You acted on them in such a way that astonishes people. Lord, I can't even believe that you took on that punishment. It's so overwhelming to me. It's so overwhelming that I can't even keep thinking about it sometimes. But God, I pray that this message of the good news of the kingdom penetrates hearts. And God, I pray for us as a church that we would feel the joy and the burden of being a messenger of hope. God, may we take advantage of this season and be courageous to talk to people about Jesus, to talk to people about their hope, and to invite people to Christmas Eve. Simple things like that, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't neglect these opportunities. So Lord, would you take this moment, take this song, and just allow your words to get into our hearts. In Christ's name, amen.